We now come to the second major category which is private equity. Private equity generally means investing in private companies or investing in public companies with the intent of taking them private. There are four broad categories of private equity. The major ones are shown over here, leveraged buyouts and venture capital. Most of this lecture will focus on these categories. Two other categories which are mentioned sometimes are developmental capital and distressed investing. I'll just say a little bit about these two strategies here and then we'll focus on the top two. With development capital, we might take a minority equity stake in an established company. Distressed investing typically involves buying the debt of mature companies which are in financial distress or financial trouble. Private equity structure and fees. The structure is quite similar to what we saw in the hedge fund industry. These are structured as partnerships. So we will have a firm. The firm or the general partner are used interchangeably. The general partner puts his own money and then the investors are called LPs or limited partners. They put their money in and essentially become partners. The decision making is done by the general partner. I'll make a high level remark here about why these firms are structured as partnerships and then this will be seen in detail later. The other option would have been to structure as a corporation. But with corporation, there is the issue of double taxation because the corporation makes money and there is a corporate tax. And then the corporation pays dividends to the investors or shareholders. And then the investors have to pay taxes on dividends. The partnership structure avoids double taxation. That's all you really need to know at this stage. In private equity, there is a concept of committed capital. If a given fund is set up where the firm or the GP says that the amount needed is 10 million, then the GP will get commitments from LPs. So LP1 might commit 2 million, LP2 might commit a certain amount, LP3 might commit 4 million and so on. But what the GP will try to do is raise 10 million through these different entities. Committed capital means that this amount is committed by the LPs. It's not explicitly given upfront. When the appropriate investment opportunity comes up, that's when the GP calls the LP and asks for either the entire committed amount or a fraction of the committed amount, depending on what is needed at the time. The management fee ranges between 1% and 3%. A fee of 2% is quite common, but this is a percentage of the committed capital. There is also an incentive fee, which is typically 20% of profit. There are several concepts that need to be covered here, but these concepts are covered in detail at level two. There is a concept of clawbacks. There is a concept of exactly how this 20% is charged. While these concepts are mentioned briefly here at level one, I will use my judgment and not spend too much time or not spend any time in fact on these sub concepts. You can read them in the curriculum if you want. But since this material is covered in detail at level two and you'll be tested on this in level two, my guess is that you will not be tested on the details at level one. This is important though, private equity strategies. One of the most important strategies is leveraged buyouts. This is where the fund or the private equity fund here acquires companies through significant debt financing. The LBO's structure comprises of equity, bank debt and high yield bonds. Let me draw a small picture that illustrates what's going on. This is the firm or the GP, the firm puts some money of its own and then it also raises money from LPs. This money is then used to invest in target companies or portfolio companies. So let's call this portfolio company one, this is portfolio company two and so on. When 
the firm or the GP invests in a portfolio company, it will put some money of its own. For example, it might put 20% of its own. So 20% is equity. But there'll be a lot of borrowing, a lot of debt. That's why it is called a leveraged buyout. If this portfolio company one costs 100 million, then 20 million in my simple example would come in the form of equity. This would be the actual money of the GP and the LPs. 70% or 70 million might come in the form of bank debt. This is typically a significant chunk. And then perhaps 10 comes in the form of high yield bonds. Clearly, this company is probably not a company which is performing extremely well. Therefore, the bonds issued over here would classify as high yield bonds. So this simplistically is the capital structure and notice the high use of bank debt. There are two types of leveraged buyouts. One is called a MBO where the current management team purchases and runs the company. So if the management team over here is purchasing and running the company, that's called a MBO. The one that is perhaps more common is a MBI, which is a management buy-in. The current management team is replaced and the acquirer, who is the GP, brings in a team which runs this company. Or obviously, there might be a combination where the management, some of the management is retained and some management comes in from the GP. It's more important here to understand the characteristics of these target companies or portfolio companies. Generally, the company that is acquired will have an undervalued stock price. Here the assumption is that we are taking over a public company and we are purchasing it so it will then be made private. The management needs to be willing. The company ideally should be inefficient initially. The whole point here is to generate value by making this company more efficient. In fact, let me just make this more explicit. How is value created over here? When the GP buys this for 100, this is an inefficient company. It probably has cash flows, but the cash flows could be much more than what this company is currently producing. Once the GP takes over, it will make the company more efficient, which will increase the cash flows and also therefore increase the value of the firm. With the increased cash flow that is generated, the debt will be paid off. So after a few years, let's say five to six years, most of this debt will be paid off and the company will be made more efficient. So let's say that the value of the company goes from 100 to 200. And for simplicity, let's also say that the entire debt is paid off. Then this equity investment of 20 ends up having a value of 200. This is an extreme case, but it illustrates what the GP is after. Continuing with the characteristics, ideally these firms, the portfolio companies or the target companies should have low leverage because the leverage will be taken once the GP is buying the company. If PC1 or PC2 is already heavily leveraged, then it would be hard to do a leveraged buyout. Strong and stable cash flows. The emphasis here is more on the stable. Some students ask about this strong. The idea being that it might be that a given company already has strong cash flows, but the GP will try to make those cash flows even stronger or even more stable. Ideally, the target company should have lots of physical assets because those assets could then be used as collateral for the loans. The second major strategy is venture capital. Here we invest in private companies, also called portfolio companies, with significant growth potential. The distinction between VC and LBO is with LBOs, we invest in stable established companies. Here we generally invest in startups or young companies which show a lot of potential. VCs or venture capitalists are typically actively involved in the companies in which they invest. And here I want to emphasize this word actively involved. You have heard 
active investments in another context also. When we talk about active investment or active management in the portfolio context, there we mean actively seeking out underpriced securities or overpriced securities. That is one use of the term active. This is a different use. This active means that you buy, a, let's say, a startup firm, and then the venture capitalist gets involved in the management of this startup firm in order to maximize value. So when you see this term active, you need to understand what context it's being used in. From an exam perspective, you also need to understand that VC investing can happen at various stages. At a high level, there are three stages, the formative stage, later stage, and mezzanine stage. You need to remember the sub stages also. Under formative, we can have angel investing, where financing is provided at an idea stage. Next comes seed stage financing. Here, financing is provided for product development and market research. And then early stage, this is where financing is provided for companies which are moving towards commercial production. Later stage financing is for companies to expand after commercial production has been initiated, but before an IPO. And with mezzanine stage, financing is being provided to help a company go public. There are more details in the curriculum, but at the very least, you need to know what is shown on this slide. Here is a possible exam question. The correct answer is B. And if you paid attention on the previous slide and went through the information carefully, you would get the correct answer quite easily. Exit strategies. The ultimate goal of private equity is to improve new or underperforming businesses. So new would be the VC context. Underperforming businesses would be the LBO context and then exit them at high valuations. Generally, companies are held for an average of five years. Obviously, the holding period might be longer or shorter. The common exit strategies are shown over here. Trade exit, this is where the company is sold to a competitor or any strategic buyer. For example, you might have invested in a small pharma company you being, let's say, the general partner, then sell this company to a larger pharma company. That would be an example of a trade sale. An IPO is generally what will give you the highest return. This is where you take the company public and the shares are sold then through an IPO to the public. Recapitalization is not explicitly an exit strategy. This is where you re-leverage the firm by raising money typically at a lower interest rate. So that might reduce debt payments and also there is a cash inflow. This cash inflow might be used to make dividend payments to investors. There can be a secondary sale where the firm is sold to another private equity firm. You might be a VC that focuses on early stage. And once the company has matured to a certain level, you might sell it to another private equity firm that focuses on later stages. And the worst case scenario is a write-off or liquidation. This is where the company does not look promising anymore. So you either write it off and or if there are assets which are worth something, you sell off those assets, settle the liabilities and get out. Diversification benefits, performance and risk. Generally, private equity investments provide higher return relative to traditional investments, or at least that is the intent. The reason why this probably happens is with private equity, we have access to private companies. If you think about public companies, you are limited, obviously, to companies that are traded on the exchange. But with Private equity, your universe is much larger, so it is probably easier or you are more likely to find companies that are inefficiently priced. You also have the ability to actively manage the company and improve the performance and hence the value of the company. 
it is also easier to use leverage. If you look at exhibit, this will show you private equity returns versus US stock returns. You will notice that the private equity returns are higher than US stock returns. But you need to take these numbers with a grain of salt because the private equity returns are based on private equity indices and private equity indices rely on self-reporting because of which they are subject to various biases such as the survivorship bias and backfill bias. We have talked about this concept in the reading on security market indices. Exhibit highlights the fact that private equity investing is also riskier than investing in the stock market. Investors actually should require a higher return because they are, exp because they are accepting higher risk. There are several risks, but the ones that are unique or the ones that are inherent to private equity investing are illiquidity risk, as you have seen, when you invest in a company through a private equity fund, obviously you put in money, you can't just immediately sell the portfolio companies. So private equity investments tend to be somewhat illiquid. You put your money in and then you expect returns in four, five or six years. Plus, given the amount of leverage involved, there tends to be leverage risk. This is more on the LBO side where there is high use of leverage and this is less so on the venture capital side where the use of debt tends to be lower. As a general advice for investors, you should identify and invest in the best performing private equity funds. There is research that has indicated that the top performing private equity funds tend to produce much better returns than funds that are not performing very well. And the reason is somewhat logical. Private equity investing, so the GP, needs to be extremely skilled at what he does. And given the amount of skill involved or the level of skill involved, obviously picking the right GP and picking the right team is critical. Portfolio company valuation. As we saw with hedge funds, here in private equity, a given private equity fund will have several portfolio companies. The overall value of the fund obviously depends on the value of the portfolio companies. The question then becomes, how do you value these portfolio companies? As we saw in equity, there are three broad strategies. Either we can come up with a value based on market numbers or comparables. We use ratios here. Or we can use discounted cash flow analysis where we take each company, estimate the future cash flows and then discount back. Or we can use asset-based valuation methods where we look at the assets, the market value or the fair value of those assets, and then subtract the fair value of liabilities. Example 7 in the curriculum is based on using multiples, which is this method. I'll give you a simple example after which you can also try example 7. If a private equity firm is considering buying a firm which produces online educational content and this firm has an EBITDA of 100 million. In the past year, four such firms were sold at an average of 10 times EBITDA. What is the estimated value? The best estimate given the data here is EBITDA of 100 million multiplied by the multiplier of 10. So our estimate would be a thousand million or a billion. Investment considerations and due diligence. You should consider current and anticipated economic conditions when you make private equity investments. Specifically, you should look at interest rate forecasts, whether capital will be available or not and you should also consider refinancing risk. If refinancing becomes unavailable, then the probability of default might go up. Don't worry too much about this. The curriculum doesn't give much details either. Long-term commitment, you need to recognize that your investment in private equity essentially requires a long-term commitment. When you put money in, 
most funds will be in existence for five to ten years so your money will come back over a multi-year period you should be extremely careful about selecting the general partner i have already alluded to this earlier the due diligence questions which we saw earlier when talking about hedge funds will also apply over here since this particular area selecting portfolio companies requires a lot of experience and knowledge you need to make sure that the gp has that experience and knowledge before you invest in a particular fund